Well, hey guys, and welcome back to Maine Fish and Wildlife for a little more remote learning and some more reading and reflection. It's December, and uh, we're going to read a short story again from a Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold, uh, this time from the month of December, and we're going to read a great story uh, entitled 65290, and you may be wondering just what, what we're doing reading a story with a title of just a series of numbers, and this one is near and dear to my heart because... Uh, this is a really neat story that Leopold wrote about a banded chickadee that he had on his property. And one of the things he did every year was band um, birds on his property to keep track of bird populations. Uh, it's a practice known as mark and recapture. We generally talk about it quite a bit in this class. Uh, and it's uh, the exact thing that we do with our campus squirrels. We capture squirrels and collar them and then attempt to recapture them in uh, subsequent years or also catch them on trail camera as well. Uh, and that is another example of mark and recapture. So banding birds is this idea that we're going to capture a bird, we're going to mark it with a band, and then we're going to attempt to recapture it at a later date, and we're going to glean all kinds of data from that, and our capture rates can help us estimate population. There's all kinds of really stuff that cool stuff that comes from it, and there are millions of banded birds flying around North America right now, including a whole lot of waterfowl carrying bands on their legs, ducks and geese, that biologists place out all summer long, and then uh, hunters return that data, and we get a lot of really important information on um, harvest rates and migratory patterns of our waterfowl, and it helps us manage these populations. So let's jump right in here, and let's read 65290, and we'll talk about uh, how to complete today's reflection activity. To ban a bird is to hold a ticket in a great lottery. Most of us hold tickets on our own survival, but we buy them from the insurance company, which knows too much to sell us a really sporting chance. It's an exercise in objectivity to hold a ticket on the banded sparrow that falleth or on the banded chickadee that may someday re-enter your trap and thus prove that he is still alive. The tyro gets his thrill from banding new birds. And that's a cool word. Tyro is kind of like uh, what you guys today would call a newbie, right? That's a, a new person, somebody who's brand new at something. The tyro gets his thrill from banding new birds. He plays a kind of game against himself, striving to break his previous score for total numbers. But to the old timer, the banding of new birds becomes merely pleasant routine. The real thrill lies in the recapture of some bird banded long ago. Some bird whose age, adventures, and previous condition of appetite are perhaps better known to you than to the bird himself. I would totally agree with that statement from our, our squirrel collaring over the years. At first, I was all about just trying to get as many collars out as I could. And nowadays, it's really the coolest thing to me to recapture a squirrel from years ago or like this year on trail camera when we caught that, cat, that uh, collared squirrel um, from two years ago out there in the TA forest. Those are the moments that are the most cool to me, recapturing an old squirrel that we've marked years ago. So let's continue on here. Thus, in our family, the question whether Chickadee 65290 would survive for still another winter was, for five years, a sporting question of the first magnitude. Beginning a decade ago, we have trapped and banded most of the chickadees on our farm each winter. In early winter, the traps yield mostly unbanded birds. These, presumably, are mostly the young of the year, which, once banded, can thereafter be dated. As the winter wears on, unbanded birds cease to appear in the trap. We then know that the local population consists largely of marked birds. What he means is, uh, as the winter rolls on there, they start to just catch purely banded birds. All the birds they're catching are ones they've already marked. And that at that point, he has a pretty good idea that most of the chickadees on his property are wearing bands. We can tell from the band numbers how many birds are present and how many of these are survivors from each previous year of banding. 65290 was one of seven chickadees constituting the class of 1937. When he first entered our trap, he showed no visible evidence of genius. Like his classmates, his valor for suet was greater than his discretion. Like his classmates, he bit my finger while being taken out of the trap. When banded and released, he fluttered up to a limb, pecked his new aluminum anklet in mild annoyance, shook his mused feathers, cursed gently, and hurried away to catch up with the gang. It is doubtful whether he drew any philosophical deductions from his experience, such as all is not ants, eggs that glitters. For he was caught again three times that same winter. So he's saying he caught this chickadee four times the same winter. He caught him once, banded him, and then three more times throughout the winter caught this chickadee. So it's not really necessarily a, a super smart one, um, but we'll, we'll continue on here and try to figure out how this thing survived for five years. 
By the second winter, our recaptures showed that the class of seven had shrunk to three, and by the third winter, to two. So what he's saying there is, by, th by three years in, only two out of those seven original chickadees from 1937 were still alive. By the fifth winter, 65290 was the sole survivor of his generation. Signs of genius were still lacking, but of his extraordinary capacity for living, there was now historical proof. During his sixth winter, 65290 failed to reappear, and the verdict of missing in action is now confirmed by his absence during four subsequent trappings. At that, of 97 chicks banded during the decade of during the decade, 65290 was the only one contriving to survive for five winters. Three reached four years, seven reached three years, 19 reached two years, and 67 disappeared after their first winter. Hence, if I were selling insurance to chicks, I could compute the premium with assurance. But this would raise the problem. In what currency would I pay the widows? I suppose in ants' eggs. So he's talking about if he was creating life insurance for chickadees, he'd have a pretty good idea on the lifespan of a chickadee. How long do they live on average? And from the looks here, it looks to me like very few of them uh, live beyond three years of age, and most of them don't live beyond two. I know so little about birds that I can only speculate on why 65290 survived his fellows. Was he more clever in dodging his enemies? What enemies? A chickadee is almost too small to have any. What whimsical fellow called evolution, having enlarged the dinosaur until he tipped over his own toes, tried shrinking the chickadee until he was just too big to be snapped up by flycatchers as an insect and just too little to be pursued by hawks and owls as meat? Then he regarded his handiwork and laughed. Everyone laughs at so small a bundle of large enthusiasms. So he's saying, what on earth would even eat a chickadee? They're, you know, too big to be eaten by things that want to eat bugs and too small to really be bothered with by most of our, you know, predatory creatures that uh, want a, a, a meal of meat. The sparrow hawk, the screech owl, the shrike, and especially the midget saw wet owl might find it worthwhile to kill a chickadee. But I've only once found evidence of actual murder. A screech owl pellet contained one of my bands. Perhaps these small bandits have a fellow feeling for, for midgets. And what he's getting, a screech owl is a tiny little owl I can show you here. Let's, let's look it up. Uh, screech owl. Let's look up a, come on, screech owl. I was building Legos with my son there. <laughs> there, we go. there we go. Images. There you go. There's a little tiny screech owl. Check out how how camouflaged those guys are, and they uh, make a really cool um, vocalization, a loud, loud screech there, uh, and a tiny little owl, maybe the size of your fist, so they would uh, happily feed on a chickadee, being a ti another tiny little predator there. <clears throat> this, it seems likely that weather is the only killer so devoid of both humor and dimension as to kill a chickadee. I suspect that in the Chickadee Sunday School, two mortal sins are taught. Thou shalt not venture into windy places in winter, and thou shalt not get wet before a blizzard. I learned the second commandment one drizzly winter dusk while watching a band of chicks going to roost in my woods. The drizzle came out of the south, but I could tell it would turn northwest in bitter cold before morning. The chicks went to bed in a dead oak, the bark of which had peeled and warped into curls, cups, and hollows of various sizes, shapes, and exposures. The birds selecting a roost dry against the south drizzle, but vulnerable to a north one, would surely be frozen by morning. The birds selecting a roost dry from all sides would awaken safe. This, I think, is the kind of wisdom that spells survival in chickdom and accounts for 65290 and his like. So he's saying chickadees really have to avoid getting wet in the wintertime before a blizzard, right? Uh, we see this all the time in Maine where a storm may start out as rain and then, you know, winds from the south are nice and warm. We have a rainy storm and then as that storm passes by, the wind switches out of the north. It gets really cold. We get a blast of Arctic air, maybe snow. And if you have a wet bird that can no longer trap air in its feathers, uh, that all of a sudden in that freezing cold, that is a death sentence very quickly. The chickadee's fear of windy places is easily deduced from his behavior. In winter, he ventures away from woods only on calm days, and the distance varies inversely as the breeze. So what he means is chickadees stay under tight cover in the winter, and they don't venture out into open windy places. And they only venture out when it's calm, and they, they only go as far as it is windy. So the windier it is, the less they're able to venture out. I know several windswept woodlots that are chickless all winter, but are freely used at all other seasons. They are windswept because cows have browsed out the undergrowth. 
to the steam heated banker who mortgages the farmer who needs more cows who need more pasture wind is a minor nuisance except perhaps at the flat iron corner to the chickadee winter wind is the boundary of the habitable world if the chickadee had an office the maximum over his desk would say keep calm i love that i love that i love a couple things here he's pointing out that these humans, you know, the steam-heated banker who mortgages the farmer who needs more cows, who need more pasture, wind is a minor nuisance. These people live inside. We're worried about, you know, monetary things more than we are the natural world. That's what he's getting at there. And then this idea that the maxim for a chickadee would be, keep calm. And this is like, you know, 80 years before people wore t-shirts that said, uh, you know, keep calm and study wildlife or whatever, whatever that cool logo is, right? His behavior at the trap discloses the, the reason. Turn your trap so that he must enter with even a moderate wind at his tail, and all the king's horses cannot drag him to the bait. Turn it the other way, and your score may be good. Wind from behind blows cold and wet under the feathers, which are his portable roof and air conditioner. Nuthatches, juncos, tree sparrows, and woodpeckers likewise fear winds from behind, but their heating plants, and hence their wind tolerance, are larger in the order named. Books on nature seldom mention wind. They are written behind stoves. That, my friends, is one of the deepest statements I think Leopold makes in this book, and I always get stuck on that. And what he's saying is these birds are always facing into the wind to keep that wind from going up below their feathers and, and cooling them off because that is a death sentence to these tiny birds. They're always pointing into the wind to allow that wind to go over the top of their feathers so they can stay warm. But that last statement, books on nature seldom mention wind. They are written behind stoves is deep. And what he's getting at there is most people who write about nature are writing inside and he spends the vast majority of his life sitting outside, sitting outside in his yard, listening to the birds, uh, you know, noting which ones are calling first in the morning, banding chickadees. The guy is constantly outside and feels that his connection to nature is a little deeper because of it. He appreciates that wind because he's out there in it as he's writing. Really cool stuff. Uh, and and he's, ca he's, he's casting a little shade on his, uh, on his uh, counterparts there with that statement. I suspect there's a third commandment in Chictum. Thou shalt investigate every loud noise. When we start chopping in our woods, the chicks at once appear and stay until the felled tree or riven log has exposed new insect eggs or pupae for their delectation. The discharge of a gun will likewise summon chicks, but with less satisfactory dividends. What served as their dinner bell before the day of axes, mauls, and guns? Presumably the crash of falling trees. In December 1940, an ice storm felled an extraordinary number of dead snags and living limbs in our woods. Our chicks scoffed at the trap for a month, being replete with dividends of the storm. So in the wintertime, our chickadees are feeding a lot on ant eggs and spider eggs and little hibernating bugs underneath these, the, the bark of trees and in little cavities in trees. And I spend a lot of time this time of year, you know, sitting in a tree, freezing, uh, watching um, little chickadees fly around in the woods in my binoculars, and they are constantly just inspecting every square inch of a tree underneath every furrow in the bark, and they're pecking away at all these little tiny bugs they're finding in the woods. And these woods seem so desolate and void of food, but when you watch those chickadees and nuthatches and juncos fly around, you realize there's actually food for these creatures everywhere, but they never stop searching. They're always looking. And uh, what Leopold's mentioning is when he's cutting down trees in the woods, they hear those loud noises. They're attracted, knowing maybe uh, they'll be able to clean up some ant eggs from these fallen trees. 65290 has long since gone to his reward. I hope that in his new woods, great oaks full of ants' eggs keep falling all day long, with never a wind to ruffle his composure or take the edge off his appetite. And I hope that he still wears my band. So it's, it's interesting, Leopold has this really, you know, realistic view of nature, but he constantly comes back to the anthropomorphic stuff, thinking about, you know, this chickadee, what, what chickadee heaven would look like, you know, and it was full of great oaks, full of ant eggs that fall all day long and no wind to ruffle his feathers. Um, just interesting stuff, and what a cool book, and what a cool guy. I wish he and I could have hung out. Absolutely would have been bros, no doubt, me and, me and old Aldo, so... Um, your assignment today, after reading this, is to go back to um, our reading and reflection assignment here. There's a few questions to answer. We can check our reading for how many winters did Chickadee 65290 survive. What predators does Leopold presume feed on chickadees? He lists a few in there that he thinks probably eat chickadees. He has direct evidence from one that we talked about and I showed you a picture of. 
And then we talked quite a bit about why a chickadee would avoid a windy area in the winter, right? There's, there's some reasons that you're not going to find them out in open windswept areas. And then the last question here, the one I'm really interested to see what you guys do with, and I love doing this, um, is Leopold determined that, chickadees, that the chickadees' three commandments in life are thou shalt not venture into windy places in winter, thou shalt not get wet before a blizzard, and thou shalt investigate every loud noise. I want you guys to choose another native Maine species. I'm looking for a creature from Maine and come up with your own three commandments for its survival. And uh, I'll give you an example. I'm going to do one, but you need to pick your own original one. You can't do this one, okay? I'm looking out my window right now. It's a rainy day at Thornton, and I'm looking out in that retainment pond, and there are mallard ducks out there, a whole bunch of them on that rainy day. And I got thinking about how much ducks seem to love a rainy day. And I got thinking, what are the three commandments of ductum? Right? Chickadees have their three commandments, according to Leopold. And to me, what would the three commandments of a mallard be? I came up with three real quick. You could come up with a whole bunch of them. Um, number one, I said um, mallards, uh, th we would say, thou shalt stay one step ahead of the ice. And what I mean by that is in the wintertime, we have a lot of mallards along the coastal strip of Maine here because all that inland water has frozen up and those mallards are pushed closer and closer to the ocean as the winter goes on. And it's no coincidence that here in December we have a lot of mallards around Saco as the, you know, we have ice forming in northern Maine and pushing those ducks southward. Our next commandment that I thought of here for my mallard duck would be thou shalt, uh, Thou shalt keep a keen lookout when feeding. If you ever watch those mallards down in that retainment pond or anywhere feeding, they're dabbling away, they're sticking their heads under the water, but there's always one or two of them alert, looking around with an eye out for predators. And there's lots of different things I would love to get a hold of a mallard duck. Many of them are avian predators, predatory birds, eagles, and uh, hawks and falcons uh, love to catch ducks. And they often do it while the duck is flying in the air. So my third commandment that I thought up would be, Thou shalt fly over water whenever possible. And if you watch ducks fly, they'll fly up and down rivers, they'll fly over lakes, and they love to fly over that water. And that's because a lot of those avian predators, those hawks and falcons, and even the eagles, really would prefer to catch them over land so that they're not, you know, dragging that bird down into the open water. And falcons, for example, just simply won't, won't chase a duck over water. Uh, they want to hunt them over land. So, and, and ducks know that, and they tend to fly low right over the surface of the water um, as a way to avoid those... Uh, falcons and hawks that are after them all the time. So just one example of three commandments for a Maine native species. I'm looking for you to come up with your own three commandments for a Maine native species, and I'm anxious to see what you guys do with this. I appreciate you tuning in for our December reading and reflection, and look forward to seeing you guys soon.